Welcome to the Business Blueprint Podcast, where we take you on an exciting adventure through our triumphs and challenges and failures in creating and maintaining a thriving six, seven, and eight-figure business. Get ready to dive into our strategies, decisions, and yes, even valuable lessons we've learned from our missteps. That's not all. We'll also bring you industry-leading guests who will provide you with their priceless insights and wisdom. Stay tuned because the captivating journey of the Business Blueprint begins right now. Hi, I'm Charles Hatley with The Business Blueprint, and today I'm joined by Rebecca Malone from Malone Hatley PC, and what we're going to be talking about is making the decision to hire your first person, you know, going from that solo partnership or, or just one or two people that are in a partnership to actually making the decision to hire that first person. We're going to talk about kind of what's going through your mind when you hire that first person, the fears that you have about hiring that first person, and, you know, what keeps you up at night when you're when you're putting out that first job ad. So, uh Rebecca, you know, my, my first question for you is, you know, who was the first person that you hired in the organization? So our very first hire was a paralegal and it was, uh, I remember it being really difficult to just mm -hmm. overcome that fear of adding anybody to the organization. But specifically when we were looking at the workload, where the time was being spent, where we could kind of make the most out of an employee, um, that was what made the most sense at the time was just to get the support on the legal work. And so that way we would have time to focus on, on some other areas. And so for us, it, it made the most sense at the time to have a paralegal as our very first employee. And, you know, as I was there too, I, I remember kind of going through the, the little bit of math that we understood at the time to try to justify the, the salary of, of the person and you know, trying to talk about ROIs and salaries and compensation structures and you know, it, it, plans for insurance and, and 401ks. And, and looking back, I, I realized how much we didn't know, but but that was okay because you know, sometimes as long as you're moving forward, you know, progress is, is better than perfection at any point in time. Uh, you know, I want to kind of walk through some of the decisions that were made early on to put together benefit packages. Can you, can you tell us a little bit about the benefit packages that you had set up? Yeah. So from my perspective, having worked at some other small law firms, I knew what it was like to not have health insurance from my employer and to try and, and go and buy my own health insurance. And I had one employer who offered like a partial stipend or something, but it was a really big struggle and that was a huge financial concern. It took up a lot of time. It took up a lot of mental energy. And that was something I just didn't want to, to do to my employees. Um, I wanted to make sure that we offered benefits that were in line with going into a bigger organization. And so when you're talking about two people going to three people, it's a huge expense, right? But, but we knew we wanted to build. We knew we wanted to have good people. We wanted to attract good talent. We wanted to keep good talent. And I personally didn't want someone who was going to feel like, oh, I've got to go get a second job or something so I can afford my health insurance or, or I'm uninsured or, you know, it doesn't even come close to covering anything. And so that was, that really weighed heavily um, in, in selecting our initial benefits. And I thought it was really cool that we also added a 401k just kind of right out of the gate. Um, again, with our first employee, that was that was kind of a huge thing. But now it's such a, an amazing thing that we're able to offer everybody in our company. Now we're we're at forty seven people or so, um, and we're able to offer, I think, a, a better benefit than what a lot of of small and even medium sized firms are um, are offering. So we do like a six percent four hundred one k match, which is just amazing to me. Um, but that was something that, again, just right off the bat, I had been at smaller firms that offered, oh, we'll do, you know, some percentage of like a Roth IRA. And it was just, it was so minimal. And then they made it really difficult to sign up for. And you really didn't get the benefit um, that you kind of initially signed up for. And so I didn't, again, I didn't want to put my employees into that position and feel like, oh, I was maybe told something that now I'm not getting, or maybe it's, it's a lot smaller than what it was presented to be. So those were our two kind of big concerns at the outset. Um, now looking back, it's like, of course we did that, obviously, you know, but when you're, when you're hiring your very first person, that's a huge weight. It's a huge financial concern. Um, when you're talking about just one employee. 
It is. And I remember when we were talking about offering, you know, employer paid health insurance and employer sponsored 401k plan, you know, we talked to other small businesses and everybody said that, you know, oh, you know, you're, we don't do that. We do a, a, you know, sponsored IRA, or we do like uh, a, a certain amount of money so that you can go out onto the marketplace and buy your own health insurance. And, you know, we talked about like, man, that doesn't seem like a good job, right? You know, when you're trying to entice yeah. people to come to work for your organization, it, it's hard to entice somebody by saying, hey, look, I, I've got this position where I am going to send you out to the marketplace to buy your own health insurance, and I'm going to do a match on an IRA. So basically, I'm not investing anything with, into you as a company. So it was very important for us to have our employees understand that we were investing in them, investing in their right. ability to grow with us. Um, and, and I also kind of remember thinking, well, I want to be bigger than these small companies. So, you know, as we were talking to these small companies, I was like, well, yeah, this may work for four or five people, but I want to be bigger than that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, kind of walk us through your, your thought process in, in talking with other business owners in, in that area. Yeah, I, I did get a lot of the, oh, we do some sort of a stipend or we basically send our employees out to, to the healthcare marketplace and then we do some sort of percentage or something like that. And that just seems like a lot more work for your employees to go through versus they're coming on board and you want them to spend the time and attention on their job, right? Mm -hmm. You want them to to make the business be successful. You want them to spend time with your clients. You want them to to care and, and be really invested with this company. And when you're sending them out to kind of go do their own work on the benefits side, it, it just runs counter to, to all of that. And so that never really resonated with me just as an employee and having been through that situation, I, that wasn't something I wanted to, to put my people through. Um, of course, at the same time, when you're a two or three person operation, you can't sign up for, you're not eligible for all the same packages and plans that a 50 person company or a hundred person company can do. Um, we wanted to at least like knock out the big ones right out of the gate. And so as we're growing and expanding, that's going to give us more opportunity to, to provide additional benefits for our employees and hopefully help us attract better talent, help us retain good talent that we have. Um, but that's really the, the mentality. Um, and, and we've talked to other law firm owners, we've talked to other types of business owners, and it just, it feels chintzy, I guess, when you're, when you're the employer and you're saying, oh no, you go, you know, kind of figure out your own stuff. And I'm not necessarily going to pay you more to account for, you know, the legwork and the extra effort that you're putting in that just, it just doesn't feel like you're going to bring in the type of employees that you want with that type of mindset. And you're not, you're definitely not going to keep those people, right? Um, there's really no incentive. There's really no, they're not really locked in. They're not really vested with your organization, your company, because they're still acting like they're a one man operation. Almost. It's, it's like, you're kind of bringing in a solo practitioner under your, your umbrella, but not really giving them the umbrella, right? It doesn't, doesn't feel like you're offering very much then. Exactly. You know, if you're not willing to invest in your employees in any organization, if you're not willing to invest in your employees, I, I think it'd be kind of uh, problematic to say, look, I'm not willing to invest anything extra into you, but I do want you to invest your time and your efforts with me. Um, yeah, I kind of want to, you know, we kind of got off uh, a tangent there about benefits. But I, I do think it's a, you brought up an important point about the amount of time it took. You know, when you're going from, you know, one to two people and trying to find a group health insurance plan, that is not something that's readily offered. You know, a lot of people will tell you, a lot of insurance uh, companies will tell you that's not even available. And when you're a one to two person operation trying to find a 401k uh, plan, I, I was there. I sat in the meetings where people were like, oh, don't do that. You don't need a 401k plan. Your employees don't care about a 401k plan. Just do a Roth. I mean, even people that supposedly sold 401k plans were trying to dissuade us from, from doing 401k plans. And it really took a lot of extra effort from, from us putting in with, with that plan, saying, look, I have the plan to want to grow the business, so I might as well put these uh, benefits in now. And I think that, you know, putting the benefits in really goes to, to the next part of this. When we were thinking about hiring the first person that, that we hired, there, there was a mindset thing. You know, we put out a job ad. 
um, that we wrote it the best that we could looking for a legal assistant. And, you know, we had this mindset of, wow, I can't believe these people want to come work for us. Kind of explain to me that mindset versus the mindset you have now about the jobs that you offer. Yeah, that there definitely was a big shift when, when you, you've, not totally confident in your ability to to provide this job you just are it's still kind of a theory um right you you've got an idea of what you're looking for you've got these ideas about what you want to provide but you haven't seen it executed you haven't seen it implemented yet and so there's that bit of uncertainty of is it really going to play out kind of the way that that we anticipate the way that we hope that it does Um, and so there's a lot less confidence going into those interviews and being like, oh, well, I'm just like some person that kind of has an office and, you know, this and that. Um, and so that, that was definitely something to overcome. And I guess the more that we've, the more that we've talked about what the plan is, the more that we've talked about how we want to grow and where we want to grow and why we want to grow, um, the more that confidence kind of comes up. And so we may not B, and we're definitely not at the final stage yet, right? This is not the the final evolution of the company. Um, But when you're bringing in people for interviews and you're telling them a little bit more about this is where our company is going, you know, do you want to be part of this? It's, It's really exciting. And it really brings in applicants that have this drive to be part of a growing organization. They want to see it grow. They want to be part of that success. They want to celebrate in your wins too and see that expansion. And so it does bring in, I think, a different type of candidate um, Mm -hmm. versus someone who's just trying to go to like a big law firm that's always been a big law firm, right? And it just kind of is a dinosaur and and it is what it is. I think you're going to bring in different different applicants. And it took us a while to sort of see it from the other side. Um, but after we had a good, a good couple of people in and they were showing us every day, their excitement. And, you know, we said, Oh, we're looking to now hire for this other position. And they're like, yes, this is so awesome. Like we're going to have five people now, or we're going to have 10 people now. It it's Mm -hmm. contagious. Right. And so it just kind of feeds, feeds itself. And you start to feel like, okay, yeah, we do have something really awesome here, something really, um, there's, there's a lot of opportunity here. And, and that does, I think, drive better candidates and a a specific type of candidate, um, that is willing to, to grow and expand and sort of learn with you. Exactly. You know, I remember sitting in that first interview with the, with the assistant that we were going to hire and, you know, on paper, she had everything that you would look for in, in a hire you know, in, in the interview, she had everything that you would want in in a new hire and me saying in my mind, like, wow, I I can't believe this person actually wants to to work here. And, you know, Mm -hmm. we were in a very small, like four person conference room and had one, I believe two offices at the time, two offices in a shared conference room in in a different office space. Um, you know, and, and one of the things that, we were, were told and advised to do was when we hired this person, we needed to offload some of the work that we had to this person to focus our time on, on the highest and best use of our time. You know, so, you know, while for an assistant, there's not a, there may not be a direct ROI, right? You may not be able to assign a, an amount that the, the assistant should produce and say, look, you're going to get a 4X ROI. You may say, look, the amount of time you're going to save me is going to allow me to undertake these higher value uh, activities. So, you know, from your perspective, what sort of higher value activities were you able to undertake once hiring that assistant? Right. So we were we were really growing in terms of the marketing and the intake side of things. And at the same time, now that we were bringing in so many clients, we had a lot of legal work to do. Mm -hmm. And all of that legal work, when you're in court every day, you're writing pleadings every day, you're doing research every day, it it then draws you out of of the marketing and the sales and and looking at how and where we're going to grow next and and business planning and, you know, all of that sort of stuff that you need to be looking for for the future. Um, I always say that attorneys really get tunnel vision, and I'm sure it happens in other industries too, but attorneys, especially when you're going into a really highly litigious case or something like that, you get this this tunnel vision. You can't see anything outside of these blinders because you're so focused on this person's case and what's going on with this motion and what's going on with the, the trial that you have coming up, something like that. 
Um, and so being able to offload some of, you know, working on discovery, some of the client communication, some of the research, some of the drafting um, really allowed us to sort of shift back to the sales and marketing side and really keep an eye on, okay, where do we need to grow next? What are, you know, what do we need to hire for next? Where do we need to be recruiting for next? Um, versus getting just swamped in legal work, legal work, legal work. And it, it does seem like at a certain point, you really have to pick a lane, right? Either you can be a business owner and you hire attorneys to do the legal work, or you can be an attorney and you can hire managers and other people like that to manage the the business side of things. And so when you're when you're kind of straddling between those two um, those two things, I think um, that was where we saw the the biggest relief was just getting out from under some of that that legal work and being able to sort of pick your head up and and look out into the future a little bit more. Yeah, I know for me, you know, my, my best use of time during that time period was, you know, looking towards the future, right? You, you'll never see the future if you're always looking down. Uh, the, the future mm -hmm. does not exist by looking down. Um, you know, it allowed me to focus in on marketing. The idea of no matter how great of a product we offer, no matter how great we were, what we did, to take a step out of that production role and say, look, world, this is what we do you know, come look, see how much, see what we can offer to you. And then on, on the sales side, it was having enough time to sit down and talk to people, you know, who are interested in procuring our services and say, look, you know, this is what we, we can do for you. And I'm actually uh, going to, to sell you th this idea. And I'm going to believe in, in what I'm telling you. And I'm going to take the time to talk to you. You know, one of the, the, the biggest things that I, I see, you know, in the legal capacity and any sort of small business capacity where you have somebody stuck in production is when they're, they'll do some marketing, they'll do some marketing, they understand, or they, they tend to overspend to have some vendor do marketing that is very simple. And then when they sit down to do their, their sales, they expect people to be so blown away by the fact that they do the production, right? And then they're wanting to, to be idolized because look, I took the time out of production to sit down and talk to you or they rush through those, those, those meetings. And rather than sit down and take the time and listen to the potential client, listen to the potential customer, they rush through those meetings saying, look, this is how great I am. If you want me, I'm here. And it seems like those people get forever stuck in production. And we get a lot of contact from people who are, are looking to get rid of their, their, their small businesses and come work for us because they are forever stuck in production. So, you know, that kind of gets to my next question to you. Are you still in production? And uh, if you aren't, what did you do to get out of production? That was that was one of those transitions that was difficult at first. And now it's like it, it was a no brainer if I had just focused in a little bit, it, it could have been done more easily, more seamlessly, right? It's like, it's like ripping a bandaid. There's all this buildup and you're so worried about it. And then you do it and you're like, oh, okay, that wasn't that bad. Mm -hmm. um, and so for, for most of my cases, I was able to sort of smoothly transition them to another attorney just within the firm and say to the client, hey, this is, you know, so-and-so who's helping me out on your case. Um, they're going to be taking more of a lead role. You know, I'm still here. I'm still supervising. I'm still managing. I'm still part of, you know, the the organization. Um, but they're going to be the one really in the driver's seat on your case. And all of my clients were really understanding about that. Um, you know, they they understood that they were actually going to get more time and attention on their cases um, from having someone else who's who's doing that full time. Right. They're just full time attorneying. Uh, they're not trying to split their time and attention between all of the other stuff that they have going on. And so I did have a couple of cases that lingered for longer than I'd like to admit. Um, and only because it was like, it should be done next week. We should be done in five days. And it just lingered and lingered and lingered and lingered. So I did have some trouble getting rid of those, but it wasn't it wasn't for any sort of issue with the client. It wasn't for any sort of issue with the case. It was just like, eh, I don't really need to worry about this one. Now, looking back, it's like, well, maybe it would have wrapped up a little bit faster had I just, you know, ripped the Band-Aid off and, and transitioned that person over. Um, and so right now, today, I do not directly handle any sort of litigation cases. 
Um, we do assist with management. We do assist with training. We do oversee the cases, all of that. We help our, our attorneys with strategy. We help our attorneys with whatever they need help with, right? But we don't um, directly handle clients. I don't have anybody's case that I am, you know, attorney number one on their file, anything like that. Hi, this is Dan Cuneo with The Business Blueprint. Thank you for taking time to listen to this week's podcast. Please join us next week for part two. Thanks for tuning in. If you found this insightful and entertaining, be sure to hit subscribe below and join us on social media to get more insight into what we are going through each and every day.